I wish to start by thanking the Dawn Commission for inviting me to give this lecture and uh, the great audience here for coming. As has been said, the title of this talk is Zero Tolerance for Unemployment and the Yoruba Nation. Zero Tolerance for Unemployment denotes a mission statement heralding a polity that is administered such that nobody lacks what to live on. It presupposes that work is available for the engagement and sustenance of all. Nobody folds his arms only to be provided for by others who will transfer earnings to him voluntarily or forcefully. Idleness is foreclosed just as hunger is kept well away. By both policy and practice, it will have become common knowledge that the polity is nurtured by all for the sake of all and the good of all. When the above is applied to the Yoruba nation, the implication is that the said region will be the vehicle for the propagation of that connotation. It would then be expected that it will reach far and wide to the extent that its appeal is appreciated for much adoption. The whole world becomes the constituency as its superlative merit would never be in doubt. For the moment, the country is the target why the continent is the next frontier of application to the global arena is contemplated. The choice of the Yoruba nation as its nursery bed is for both convenience and expediency. For somebody who will have to taste the wine before it will be sensible to recommend it for universal consumption for the benefit of the winemaker the drinkers, and the community at large. The issue of zero tolerance for unemployment as a policy instrument could be likened to a simple therapy that is capable of dealing with diverse ailments for multiple ages in different territories. While it is tempting to assume that its application will be generally known and easily familiar. The truth of the matter is that housewives are as ignorant of its existence as their husbands are as ignorant of its efficacy. But there can be no doubt that the early man knew that he must work to be able to eat and live, and there will be no shortcut to the repetition of this from one age to the other. At what point it dawned on a particular generation to allow this reality to be compromised must remain unknown. The economy is deemed to be operating at the level of full employment when the size of the population that is unemployed at a point in time is not higher than 4%. This 4% statistical margin is theoretically allowed to accommodate the men and women of that economy who might be temporarily out of employment as nursing mothers, 
recuperating invalids or others somewhat in transition from working to non-working status until the chance will soon appear for their eventual rehabilitation. In other words, those who will not be engaged at work will be so tiny as a percentage of the population that their absence at the labor market will not create a major issue or an upset as such. The economy will be able to proceed as if it is not under any shock or inadequacy. That will mean that uninhibited production will be responsible for the consumption needs of the people such that there will be no scarcity translating to lack or poverty in the land in the final analysis. On the other hand, an economy will be operating at a precarious level when the issue of unemployment is not properly managed. When an economy leaves the 4% unemployment level of normalcy and moves to two digits, the alarm must be loud and clear that danger is dancing. There can therefore be no doubt that the present situation of chronic unemployment as we now live with is patently unacceptable. The model of zero tolerance for unemployment must have been what the war started with, for it is unimaginable that at the exception of the early age, some will be working while others will wait to be fed from the sweat of the laboring others. Since nothing could be consumed if it had not been produced in the first instance, it was that economy that could support ample creation of utilities by way of bumper production that will advertise prosperity and banish lack and penury so as to promote growth and development. With the ability to feed more mouths, the polity will be well placed to move ahead and achieve greater expansion with time. It will then be able to relate well with other communities in the neighborhood and beyond. Zero tolerance for unemployment is here presented as a policy option with the goal of restructuring the economy such that nobody is afflicted or oppressed with the yoke of joblessness. In other words, unemployment is targeted for elimination as everybody settles for doing one thing or the other at a point in time, even though one might have to change or move over to engaging in something else, a preferred alternative subsequently becoming available. It is as if the committee of the whole house is at work since everybody in the polity is positively engaged or involved in the efforts to produce the goods and services that will be needed for consumption both locally and externally. In the final analysis, a polity or country is rich when the goods and services translating to the wealth of the nation enjoy abundant production. On the other hand, a polity or country is poor when the goods and services translating to the wealth of the nation are scantily produced. If everybody who is willing and able to work is so engaged, the national cake that will be baked will be as large as possible, whereas it will be diminished to the extent that some who are able and willing to work are disengaged. This loss or leakage to the economy is the explanation for poverty, and its elimination is a part of wisdom for an economy to be lifted up. What zero tolerance for unemployment seeks to achieve is a structured economy 
that will provide ample employment opportunities for the people both in the traditional areas and to create avenues so as to guarantee some just wealth generation of the well-known factors of production, land, labor, capital, and entrepreneurship, land is the factor on which to anchor what will be happening. Whereas labor as a factor of production harbors its own challenges, just as capital and entrepreneurship also harbor theirs, land is available everywhere in its varieties to support one agricultural practice or the other. Young men and women, as well as others, who might be interested will be allocated land for agriculture and cottage industrialization by the local government authorities who will have held such land in trust for the people under special arrangement. People who would otherwise have been jobless will thus be rehabilitated to be economically productive, socially relevant, and psychologically adjusted. They will make their contribution to the baking of the national cake and thus deserve to partake of its consumption just as they will join others in securing environmental transformation. These sponsored farmers and artisans will have been engaged through their local government authorities who will screen them and make available to them agricultural inputs like manure, seeds and seedlings, as well as recommend them for soft agri support and industrial shared construction loans from the cooperative societies that government will have empowered for this purpose here and there. They will work in association with the local farmers and artisans with whom they should engage in mutual stimulation of ideas as they share with them the benefits with which government will be assisting them. Additionally, agricultural extension workers and itinerant technical supervisors from cognate ministries will be regularly assigned to visit and motivate them in the local government areas of their residence. Instead of wasting away as unemployed city and country dwellers, these sponsored farmers and artisans will brighten socio-economic life in the different local government settings here and there. Apart from reversing the natural tendency of rural urban drift, what will be happening will have the desirable effect of opening up local areas for environmental elevation that could lead to identification of places that could be useful for tourist attraction and attention. The multiplier effect might include the promotion of agro-based industrialization. Zero tolerance for unemployment as a policy instrument has the capacity and the capability to change the economy from the path of depression and doom to one of bounty and opulence. This is because it impacts the economy at its structure why those who are employed in what they have been doing will continue to earn their living as before, their compatriots who will have wasted in want will now face a ray of hope. They will have been bailed out of the dehumanizing pain of joblessness, anger, hunger, and shame. They will thus be able to join others as they respond encouragingly to what opportunities become available to them in the unfolding dispensation. The beauty of it all is that what is happening in a particular local government area is also featuring elsewhere in the polity such that the overall impact will be gigantic. It will thus not be fashionable 
for an area to complain of marginalization and remain ungovernable on the perceived belief of suffering from injustice. The course would thus be clear for building the community together to weather all storm and prepare to face the challenges of modernization such that the African countries of our day and age will not become failed states ready for recolonization after the glamorous celebration of the great anniversary of their freedom from colonial rule. What is envisaged in the policy and practice of zero tolerance for unemployment is a social, economic, and political turnaround that will resemble a miracle in nation building. It will thus be realistic to expect that a citizenry that is nurtured and governed with malice to none and charity to all will demonstrate optimism and patriotism rather than scheme to throw out the baby with the bath water as could happen in ultimate revolution that could terminate faith states and send the continent backwards for two centuries. Rather than allow lack and scarcity to dominate in the African countries of our day and age, zero tolerance for unemployment would eventually boost economic production here and there and advertise prosperity as poverty is shown the way out. People who were initially engaged in what their hands found to do could eventually relocate or migrate to other jobs more relevant to their level of training and skill acquisition when such opportunities emerge as the transformed economy will correspondingly open up multifarious avenues. They will then be more highly productive and earn enhanced remuneration that will eventually boost the gross domestic income. As a policy instrument, zero tolerance for unemployment enthrones a win-win situation which is required to re-energize world economy that is struggling through the incubus of global economic meltdown that has refused to roll away. From one polity to another, from one country or continent to another, and covering the expansive zones of the world, economic managers will do well to disallow any leakage and utilize available opportunities to grow and glow productive resources that will lead to abundant wealth generation that will stand as shock absorbers come any eventuality. It is certainly a healthy situation for school leavers and others in need of vocational or professional rehabilitation to know that there is provision for them to engage in something as a matter of urgency to tie body and soul together, even though they will have to move to something else, much better and relevant to their training and skill acquisition for higher remuneration and satisfaction. It is when the economy is operating at close to full employment which zero tolerance for unemployment will facilitate that various opportunities will become available for further employment generation. If the states of the Yoruba nation, Lagos, Oyo, Ogun, Oshun, Ekiti, and Ondo decide to adopt the policy and practice of zero tolerance for unemployment, they will certainly benefit from economic restructuring that will put smiles on the faces of the people and make governance a big delight. A situation in which the unemployment figure is reckoned to be higher than 24% is definitively unsettling. 
when the factor of disguised unemployment is added, the alarm is deafening. For if an able-bodied man or woman carries a tray of ball-pointed pens or biro to sell at the motor park, he or she is no doubt hiding his or her idleness. Or if all that a man or woman is engaged in is shoe shining or fingernail cutting at the motor garage, there is the need for a more reliable employment. Lagos State, that has more of urban land resources and less of rural land resources than the others, we need special arrangement to obtain farmland for use in this regard. Oyo, Oshun, and Ikiti will concentrate more on arable farming and animal husbandry, while Ondo and Lagos will tango with flourishing fish farming. Whatever form of agricultural practice is affordable, in the particular vicinity will be the center of attraction while agro-based industrialization will feature here and there. The idea is to create ample employment opportunities in agricultural industry such that everybody will not be scrambling for white collar jobs that have become rare commodities especially as we are talking of sustainable employment, the way to tackle the economy at its structure is to utilize land as a factor of production to perform the desired miracle. We have argued above that labor as a factor of production cannot be the pivot on which to hang the project at hand for labor is hampered by issues of unionization and others, while capital is not easily accessible in each of the local government areas. Entrepreneurship as a factor of production is even more problematic, for its availability is rare, as it very much depends on the interplay of the other factors at their maturity. For the project at hand, each state governor of the block will see himself as the chief baker of the cake for the block. School leavers, young men and women, as well as others in need of vocational rehabilitation will register at the local government headquarters of the particular state of the block. They will find their about data including their educational backgrounds, skill acquisition, and their general preparation for the jobs they seek. Some of them might be able to secure farmland or land for agro-based industrial shares on their own. Others will need the assistance of the local government authorities who will be mandated to hold such land in trust for the people. Each project farmer or artisan formerly enlisted in the scheme will be entitled to a monthly stipend of 15,000 Naira or whatever the approved minimum wage in the case, which will be regularly paid for 12 months after which the participant will be deemed to be able to stand on their own. The participants will also be entitled to inputs like seeds and seedlings of good pedigree, manure of fertilizers where applicable, as well as soft loans as earmarked currency that participants cannot divert away to social or other frivolous use. Such loans will be guaranteed by the neighborhood cooperative societies, which will also assist the participants in the marketing of their products. Additionally, itinerant agricultural and industrial extension workers from the relevant ministries will be available to give training and retraining instructions to the participants from time to time. 
the participants will operate in their local government areas in cooperation rather than competition with the local farmers and artisans who had kept the economy going from time immemorial. They will share with them some of the resources with which government will be assisting them as they also contribute their quota towards transforming the social and environmental life of the vicinity. The state will benefit from receiving the taxes that both of them will pay, while the economy as a whole will move on to create multiple opportunities for employment generation for the benefit of all. The governance of each of the states of the block will ensure that each of the local government authorities under them engage in competitive modernization as participants keep a record of their productive efforts for ease of comparison from one period to another and across to their distant counterparts. This is to be sure that successes are celebrated while failures are noted to foreclose their negative repetition. People will be encouraged to pursue the task before them with courage and dedication to be able to solve whatever challenges the operation of the project will pose so as to strengthen the appeal of zero tolerance for unemployment policy and practice to the other parts of the country and even beyond. The six states of the block, which will serve as the nursery bed for the prosecution of the policy and practice of zero tolerance for unemployment, will be enabled to demonstrate to whom it might concern that the experimentation is worth the while. The project farmers and artisans in them will occupy their communality in the different local government areas be active participants in production and so qualified to join in consumption while contributing their quota to neighborhood social economic transformation. Life to them will not be a question of mere chance. Definite design is involved. When aggregated to the national level, the impact is formidable. The farmer is no longer a one crop farmer. He could try animal husbandry on the parcel of land not immediately required for arable farming. He could raise poultry for both eggs and flesh while utilizing available water resources for fish farming. He will save costs by reserving animal waste for manure instead of expensive fertilizers. Planting vegetables could feature more or less as recreational activities why those who might be technically inclined will express themselves in cottage industrialization as might be required. There will be chance to attend seminars that will be mounted for their self-improvement, while the general enlightenment that will be available to them will stand them in good stead as patriotic citizens of the fatherland. In this lecture today, the Yoruba nation is called upon to pioneer the adoption of the policy and practice of zero tolerance for unemployment to trigger off economic restructuring that will revolutionize the entire land and life and extend to the prolonged reach of its application. The issue is to make sure that things will not be the same again. This is to mark a turning point where and when history will indeed turn. In this regard, analogy could be found in the GSM revolution in Nigeria, in which communication has been sumptuously facilitated, unlike the previous situation in which subscribers had to carry ladders and lines about the whole place and track down reluctant telephone technicians who must disappoint one unlucky customer so as to be able to answer another seeker of favor of attention. 
Or is it difficult to remember how that one had to drive to another part of the town, if not another city altogether, to be able to make international calls? That the setting has not been the same again is attested to by all, such that it is fashionable to wonder how we have managed to live without the GSM facilities all along the previous decades or centuries of our existence. Or is it easy to describe to the younger ones what communication life was in the country before the GSM revolution? Will the stories not smell too much of exaggeration to tell how much was paid for a line and what the cost of a handset was when the tour began? Another analogy is found in the uniqueness of the transforming impact of the Industrial Revolution of Britain in which that country pioneered bumper production effort that exceedingly heightened creation of utilities, generated so much wealth while multiplying employment opportunities for the citizenry. Not only did Britain become the workshop to the whole world, the rest of the world became her apprentices. As industrialization became a global phenomenon, mankind has come to be divided into developed and underdeveloped economies that have remained poles apart. The haves and the half nots have distinctly operated such that it could be said that there are indeed two wars rather than one. Things have not been the same again, so that it could be said that a turning point where and when history itself turned had been reached. The advocacy of a policy prescription of zero tolerance for unemployment seeks a setting with a difference that society be organized in such a way that we build a nation where no one is oppressed in the sense that no one is unemployed. That we build a nation where it is the people's right to live and work. As food is necessary for existence, work must also be required to complete the picture. The slogan Ishe ni ogu ishe readily captures the centrality of vocational engagement as poverty alleviator. If employment is the therapy for poverty, its security must be the concern of the government and the governed. The dehumanizing reality of joblessness is such that all stakeholders will do well to foreclose it if society will retain its sanity. Not only is a jobless person a hungry, angry, and unhappy individual, he or she is also something of a security risk. There is not much to interest an unemployed person in the survival of a polity just as there is not much to excite a blind man in the beauty of a rainbow. It was not for nothing that the classical economists will agree that it was worth the why to keep people employed in digging the ground if only they will immediately fill it back rather than allow them to be jobless. Indeed, zero tolerance for unemployment was by and large the policy and practice in the African traditional economies in which breadwinning concerned just about everybody in the local communities as production and exchange took place internally and across the zonal frontiers of the pre-colonial societies. There would therefore be no gap or gorge between potential gross domestic product and actual gross domestic product. Modern nation building should take this useful lesson 
that it is when all hands are on deck that the generation of the wealth of the nation will be as substantial as possible. This is to reduce poverty and promote prosperity for the benefit of the citizenry. When all is considered, there is no doubt that there is currently so much poverty in the land. Housewives are groaning, while breadwinners are grumbling. Yet, it has been so for so long. It has been endemic and enduring poverty of fundamental origin and giant energy. There can therefore be no better time to restructure the economy along the zero tolerance for unemployment solution under discussion. I thank you all for listening. Um, thank you very much. So, um, like I said earlier on, um, Baba's methodology is one that goes back into history to explain uh, modern dynamics in the areas of um, politics, political economy, in relation to distribution, trade, employment, and such variables. Um, I will let the acting DG uh, say a few words, then we'll throw the floor open for questions and answers. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Prof. We have all listened attentively to um, Baba preferring solutions to how we can address the critical issue of unemployment in this country, particularly in our region. Um, as I said in my opening remarks, it is um, a fundamental problem that needs to be confronted. And um, as I said, this is Yoruba historical conversation where we'll expect a lot of people to chip in and maybe ask questions, comments. Um, there is no one size um, or one, there's no silver bullet solution to the issue of unemployment. But we need to start addressing it. And one is not afraid to say at this podium that I'm not sure that our governments even understand the, the challenge that's before us. I'm not sure. Um, we, I won't use the word lip service, but it seems as if there's more grandstanding at times than actually confronting this issue when we talk of unemployment. And there are several things that seems like, oh, that's a no-brainer, that can be done which we don't seem to be doing at the moment. But I'm glad that, Prof, you've addressed a few things here. You've started that conversation again. And what we take away from here, we'll pass it on to our principles. Some of them are represented here. Um, for me, I say it all the time. It's, it is disheartening when I, people come over to me and say, oh, please, can you get us a job? And you speak to someone, how long have you been out of work? Or how long have you been job hunting? Oh, I graduated 20, like 2010. And you are saying, that's eight years. What have you been doing? Or you find graduates, master's degree holders, who are being paid 10,000. I mean, at least I know someone who... She was being paid 20000 for like two years with an MSc in economics teaching in a secondary school. That's on down employment. I don't care what you say. You might say, oh, but she's employed. I'm sure she didn't obtain an MSc to be collecting 20000 Naira. We have thousands of those ones. And look at those who are even doing nothing. Those who are engaged as drivers who are graduates driving you around. We need to address the issue. And I'm looking forward to robust contributions here this afternoon from everyone. And we can go away knowing that at least we started this discussion and 
as I said, we will send it down to our states. Please, there are no right or wrong answers. Even for my youth coppers here, don't think, oh, this is not my forte. There are no right or wrong answers. Say something. Thank you. Thank you.